All right, as folks are filing in, um, I just wanted to remind people that the session's going to be recorded. So if you've got to step out or you've you know missed other sessions or maybe can't join it, future sessions that we're offering live, I just want people to know that this is going to be recording so you can access those through the DOE website. And Gordon, I appreciate the joke about too many people in the canoe. I actually just made that joke in another meeting. What are the odds? Well, I guess if you know your uh, canoe etiquette. So I'm gonna give just a, another minute or so. as people come in from the waiting room. Hey, John. How's it going? It's going well. Great. And I do want to remind people that the slide deck we're going to be using today, um, everybody that registered for this session, this will be sent out by email. So you can expect that coming at some point in the near future. And um, at the end of the session, we'll have the information about getting your certificate, your contact of hour as well. Um, and the other sessions that we've offered as part of this remote learning 101 series. Um, like I said, they're available or will be available as they're recorded and as they become available on uh, the DOE website. Um, and you can certainly watch those and you can get contact hours for those as well. So hopefully this will be a nice refresher. And the topic today, like the topic yesterday, I think is a pretty dense one. So we want to get rolling in just a minute here and get through what we have for content, but um, Emma and I were just talking earlier, it really seems like there's the potential to dig into this a lot more. And I think there might be potential for offering some uh, more in-depth sessions on engagement, maybe things geared towards different grade levels or something along those lines. So just kind of have that thought in the back of your mind if there's anything that you, uh, don't, you know, isn't maybe mentioned today or maybe we don't go into as much depth as you might like. We'll be kind of looking for those things. Oh, and Gordon had asked about uh, the pictures on the slide. So these are Bitmojis, which actually is a piece we're going to briefly touch on today. So Bitmoji, for those of you who haven't used it before, is a fantastic tool for uh, kind of cartoonifying yourself. It can be a nice way to engage with students. So that's a tool. And I know <laughs> I should mention, we don't have this scheduled yet, but we are definitely going to be offering a um, session on Bitmojis and Bitmoji classrooms because it's certainly a, a hot topic recently. I know Emma's preparing things regularly. And it's been part of, I know a lot of people have been using them for the past few years. A lot of my teacher friends that use Seesaw integrate them in there. So something to keep in mind. All right, let's check our time. All right, we are past 11.05. So I want to get rolling with things, even though I know people are still kind of trickling into the room. Um, so my name is John Graham and I'm the Elementary Digital Learning Specialist at the Maine Department of Education and I'm being joined by Emma who I'll introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Emma Banks. I'm the Secondary Digital Learning and Computer Science Specialist at the Department of Ed. 
we're excited to be concluding the first week of module two today. Yes, absolutely. So this module, module two, um, gives you a little layout of the different parts. So you can see, so we're on part three, designing remote student, designing for remote student engagement. So I think, like I was saying, there's a lot here. We'll try to get through as much of it as we can in the time that we have. So when you're thinking about engagement, I think this is kind of three areas that you wanna be thinking of, behavioral, cognitive, and emotional engagement. So there's a little description there of the different types of engagement and what that means. So you're gonna have different approaches for different levels, but I think you wanna be aware of all of those as you're thinking about the needs of your students and trying to bring them into your remote learning situation. This is a nice framework that I found, the Adolescent Community of Engagement Framework. So something to look at and kind of be mindful of. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time you know, breaking this down, but obviously the student engagement piece is right at the center. And the other pieces that you wanna keep in mind is obviously the engagement between student and teacher, the engagement that in, ties in the parent with the process, and students engaging with other students, that peer engagement piece. So that's something you wanna be thinking about um, in the design of remote learning. Obviously that looks a little different at different grade levels. And one of the things that's really important um, in terms of remote learning, as many of us have found out, whether you're you know, on the teacher end or if you're on the parent end or on the teacher and parent end, but that teacher-parent engagement you know, between those two is so vitally to making remote learning work. So that's something we'll spend a little bit of time talking about. So we'll start with, because obviously the most important, important thing is that relationship between the teacher and the student. So a couple um, items to be keeping in mind when you're kind of framing how you do that. One is to be having updates and announcements on whatever mechanism is that you are using to communicate with your students. So if you're using Seesaw, for example, having a morning message, maybe a recording that you send out or share daily. Um, if you're using Google Classroom, just to show that you're present, I think is really important. Sometimes um, you might set up something that's very static and there isn't a lot of back and forth with um, teacher and student. So there's something you wanna keep in mind that whatever you're putting out there, you put out with a certain level of frequency. And if you have it regular, um, students will kind of know these are the times to be checking in that there'll be a new update. So if you update it early in the morning and students are getting on you know, throughout the day, they're seeing something new for that day. Um, frequent feedback, I think obviously that is one of the pieces that's really important. You're not in a physical classroom space where you can be engaging with student. So it does put some um, demands on uh, teachers in that you have to be kind of constantly checking in and kind of seeing where students are if you have a more asynchronous setting going on, but you really want to be trying to make those frequent points of contact by giving feedback to work. And a lot of the tools like Seesaw, for example, you can give really quick feedback, um, do a audio recording or um, like something and just little things like that, that just shows that you're engaging with the work that students are doing. It's very important just to be making those little extra steps. And I think varying the mediums is really important. If you're always pushing out kind of text um, assignments and work and stuff that way, it seems very less personalized. So I think video certainly helps. Um, I was on a meeting with um, some librarians recently and they were saying with their read alouds, they were kind of torn between, you know, do you just videotape the book so the students can see the book clearly? Do you do that? But also like 
get a videotape of your face. So you're showing that. So I think that's one of the things to be, be thinking about is that you want students to be making those connections between you and them and seeing you and hearing your voice, that's all important. Um, so even if they can't see your voice, if there's not a video, the audio component can be really nice as well. So um, I mentioned Seesaw earlier, you can do audio recordings to give feedback and that can be, you know, hearing your voice is really nice. I know not everybody likes the sound of their own voice, but it kind of is what it is. And I'm also, I think mentioning memes in there, um, especially engaging with older, I think older kids, it's just kind of such a part of culture and how we communicate now. So feel free to bring in memes and keep things light and funny. It helps making those, you know, making those connections. That kind of moves into the next one, adding your own personal touch. So if that's something that you like to do, I think infusing some humor into your classroom takes a little bit, you know, it's a little bit different effort in a virtual setting, but certainly something that can be done. And I think especially moving into next school year, if we were to be continuing with remote learning at the fall, building those personal connections are gonna be really challenging. So it's gonna be important that you think about what are the things about yourself that you can be sharing to be building that relationship with your students so they can know you and who you are and kind of where you come from, the things that sometimes when they're in your classroom space, they're gonna be picking up on some of those things or just you know things that are going to be said in passing, um, you have to be a little bit more explicit about it in the digital setting. And the flip side of that is getting to know your students. So one of the things that I've really liked about Zoom meetings is that everybody's name is attached. So I feel like being able to use people's names is really easy. Um, and as far as learning names and learning faces and names, and I think most teachers would tell you, you know, the quicker you can learn your students' names, the quicker you can make those deeper connections with them. Um, so any tools that you can use to kind of leverage better learning their names, but also better learning who they are and what they're into and stuff like that really builds those deeper connections. And uh, I mean, there are a lot of different ways that you can do that. One of the ways that I have heard teachers say that they've used is having kind of an unstructured time, like a virtual lunch bunch, just saying, you know, I'm going to be here. We're not doing any, we're not doing school in particular, but if you just want to drop in here and chit chat with some of your friends, um, I think having those times available here and there can be really helpful for kids. So certainly if there's anybody on this call that has done something like that, um, we're going to have an opportunity to share a little bit later, I'd love to hear some, you know, some of those structures and any of these different pieces that I've mentioned that you've been leveraging to build or kind of reestablish student connections. So moving on to another. Oh, what was that? Well, I know. I know a piece of structured time that has been in my classroom, whether it's virtual or not, is that a little bit of downtime at the beginning of the class just to get to know how they're doing and what's going on and sharing their lives has helped. Absolutely. And I think that's, I think that's one of the things is, and having that time, having that time set up, but have students know that that time is going to happen. I think that's really important as well. So students, you know, they'll know that the first five minutes of class, um, if we're getting on a, a video conference or like the last 10 minutes, it's gonna be time that you guys can just chit chat and share. Um, I actually met with some Boy, uh, Boy Scout leaders a few weeks ago um, to talk about protocols around Zoom meetings and stuff. And that was something that a lot of people really liked was mm. the idea of, you have your certain meeting stuff that you've got to get through, but just let them know, you know, the last 50 minutes, you guys can just chit chat and be goofy, maybe play a game. If you find that kids need some sort of structure, sometimes you, I mean, you've got to, they're not going to necessarily just utilize that time in the best way. Sometimes they might need a little bit more structure to that unstructured time. 
Um, my, Spanish, my Spanish three group often mentioned that it was a difference in my classes from others that they were given time to share their opinions and worldviews. Absolutely. I think part of a global language classroom anyways is to try to get them to think of worldviews and their place in them. So. De definitely. Um, so, I mean, this ties right into kind of the social emotional learning and just making those connections. So some of these, I mean, it's kind of rehashing that time, but having themes or prompts to kind of your day or your meetings, I think it's nice. You know, you want to have a hat day and everybody's going to show up with a hat. It seems like something small, but it's, I mean, it, it's something that kids get excited about and they like looking forward to and planning those things out. So if you can let them know ahead of time, hey, on this day, we're going to get together and we're going to have class as usual, but I mean, you can wear a hat or wear a sports jersey or dress like a pirate, whatever it is that you decide on for a theme. It can be fun to, you know, do those things so kids have something to look forward to for that particular class. And then the other part of that can be prompts. If you have a prompt for them and it could be you know we're doing a show and tell something simple like that or maybe something that's more reflective you know what is a book that you've been reading during our during your time i want you to you know, come and share those books because some of your peers might like to hear other books that people are reading things like that and this isn't just good for meetings with kids if you're meeting with adults it's good to have those prompts as well i know at the Department of Education, we've definitely had that with our department meetings, that it's like, yeah, we've got to have some prompts, share some things. And the, um, I know meeting with the early learning team, it's been really funny because I feel like we've learned all these different things about one another. So certainly that's something to be considering as well. Um, and that kind of goes into the next one, those opportunities to share. In a remote learning setting, kids are in their home with all of their stuff and they want to show their things. I know with little kids, they're wanting to show off pets and younger siblings and stuffies and stuff like that. And it's almost like you just have to understand that that's the case and just build that time in so they are able to share that. Otherwise, they're going to get, you know, kind of get frustrated and they maybe get distracted because they want you know, they want to share and talk about their dog. So again, having that opportunity, but just be very clear about we're going to have this time at this time, and we're not going to be sharing our dogs randomly throughout our class time meetings. Um, working together is really key as well. So if you can, and this is obviously very age dependent and developmentally dependent, if you can get kids to work together in some settings and at young, younger age groups you might just have to maybe meet with a smaller group of students so you can work with them so they're able to work with one another it can get tricky in the larger class settings um you know whether you're trying to do breakout rooms or something like that um you just kind of have to be aware of if you're going to attempt to do that just the technical challenges that you might have there but I've definitely heard from some high school and middle school teachers that they've done breakout rooms and students have had, you know, a fun time doing that and even productive times in those breakout rooms. So that can happen. I think as long as students have clear expectations about what they're supposed to do during that time, you pop in and out of those spaces, no different than a, you know, a regular classroom where you'd have kids working in groups and you would be kind of moving around and checking in with the groups to see what they're doing. Um, and then the last one, fun and games. I think if you have some of those pieces built in, we'll mention a few later on, it's a great way for students to build relationships and have fun. And then I think the biggest thing that I've heard from teachers is it just seemed like after April vacation, getting a lot of kids to come back was a big challenge. So trying to have those um, things in place that students will want to come back. And, you know, coming back just to play a game or whatever, it might seem like, eh, you know, I, I want them to come back to learn. Hopefully you can lure them back with kind of those fun and games and they'll want to be there and then they'll be ready, ready to learn. So 
So building into the kind of next piece here, this is really crucial. Oops. Really crucial is involving the parents part of it. So um, obviously the situation, I feel like if you've joined me for these other sessions, maybe I'm sounding like a broken record, but the remote learning that happened this spring is not ideal remote learning. It really is that kind of crisis learning situation where people, teachers are preparing on the fly, parents are being asked to do different things and kind of step in and fill new roles. And it's, it's challenging for everyone. So I think one of the things in an ideal remote learning situation is that you can hopefully set up um, some of those models ahead of time. So the first one, setting up a reliable line of communication. I think having that consistency is really important. Obviously, different districts have different policies around communicating with um, students and sometimes parents. They are kind of preferred modes. So I think one of the things to be thinking about is, you know, what is the best mode for you? What is the best mode for your parent? But kind of trying to be consistent with that as much as you can because if you you know if you're used to texting with a parent and then all of a sudden you're shifting to email and that can be really frustrating if you've kind of shifted from one to another um schedules and agendas i've kind of hinted at this a few times i think if you're able to share out a schedule of you know, zoom meetings or meeting times deadlines things like that with a parent that can be really helpful to just have that one schedule to refer to. A lot of, um, you know, no different than a lot of us have student information systems that have student schedules that parents can print out and know. But in a remote learning situation, it's so important to be, you know, making those, making those connections with when, when are these meetings happen that students have to be present to, at, when are you know deadlines or kind of expectations of work to be completed? When are those happening? And then if you're having those meetings face to face with students, to let parents know, and obviously and students, but also parents, but to let them know kind of what's going to be happening in that meeting, what preparation might they need to go through so those meetings can be successful. Um, as a parent myself, I can just say, you know, knowing my kids are getting on a meeting at this time, making sure that you know, they have adequate bandwidth, that they're in a quiet space, that they have you know, whatever resources they need. You know, there's nothing worse than in the middle of a meeting, somebody's like, oh my gosh, I need to go grab such and such. Especially with kids, sometimes they get lost in their house going to get something that they need to go get. Um, support with the technology, I think is really important. I've seen from a lot of um, a lot of tech folks um, around the state that they had put together videos and sent out things to their parents so they would understand when we're in a Zoom call, you know, these are the different buttons and these are how they work. Or I, somebody that I talked to actually did a, like their first video conference session, they just went through all of the buttons. And that sounds kind of silly, but you would do that in a regular ed classroom you know, it makes sense to do that in a, in a remote learning environment. So if you are kind of planning on doing something like that, you know, that totally makes sense. That's fine. And just, you want to kind of plan that into your schedule. Um, if you have expectations around the use of technology, having something with parents in mind, you know, this is how we're going to be using it. This is why we're going to be using it. Those can all be helpful prompts and pieces for parents and just kind of understanding that some parents, you know, the technology is going to be very difficult for them. And I mean, I say parents, but sometimes it's grandparents, you know, whoever a child is, you know, is kind of in proximity taking care of that child. I mean, obviously it varies widely. So they're going to have varying levels of comfort with the technology. So just try to, you know, plan appropriately and have some structures in place to support them. Um, Moving on to the, the next one, less is more. I think this is a huge piece to kind of take, you know, take into account. If you can send out kind of those blast messages where the announcements, because um, 
people are obviously going to need to know what's going on and what's happening. But the kind of more general announcements, it's good if you can send those out to, you know, so everybody has access, whereas emails or just some of those other lines of communication, you know, directly with a parent, um, that's kind of another tier to be considering. And then the meetings part of it, I think to be really mindful of if you're going to have a meeting, you really want to make sure that that time is well respected. You know, emails people can read at their, you know, at their leisure, respond to hopefully, you know, with some sense of, you know, responding promptly, but know that you're, if you email a parent, you know, at the beginning of the day, you might not get a response until the evening or something like that. Um, but if you're having a meeting and sometimes you just need to do that, have a meeting with a parent, you know, bring in an administrator, other support staff that might, might work with a student, bringing in all of those, all of those people, I mean, you can do that. And there are times that it's appropriate. I think just trying to be mindful of, you know, making the most of that time if you're working on setting up that time. There's n nothing worse than kind of like, having a meeting and it's kind of like, did we really need to have this meeting? Could you just sent an email along? That might've been a little bit, you know, more time efficient for everybody. Um, and then that kind of ties with bringing other people in. So if you're able to loop in grandparents, um, if students have mentors or if they have other support people, if you have ed techs that they've built a connection with in your building or other staff members, if you're able to bring those people in to the involvement in some way. I mean, this is just good practices for school in general, but in that remote learning setting, it can be really important. So if there's some issue that's going on or some challenges during this type of you know, learning situation, that there are other people that can be helpful. And then the last one, I think, be open to surveying um, your parents and just asking them, you know, checking in how they're feeling things are going, or, you know, if they have suggestions or things that might be changed, or if, you know, you might get a better sense of what's working or not working just based on maybe what they don't say. So always, I think it always makes sense to kind of offer up surveys and allow people to give you a certain level of feedback. Doing it in a survey form can make it a little bit more digestible than just kind of sending out an email and getting you know, responses that can be all over the place. Survey can keep it a little bit, maybe a little bit more organized and a little bit more meaningful. All right, so moving on to, um, I think one of the key parts, so this is kind of getting into the actual class, you know, classroom class time itself. Um, Teacher Toolkit, um, that website, and like I said, we're going to be sharing out this PowerPoint. So most of the things that you see that are underlined are actual hyperlinks. So teachertoolkit.com, they have all kinds of different strategies that are commonly used in classrooms. And I just pulled out three that I've used or have been part of in a um, Zoom setting just in the past few months. I've seen these work, so I just wanted to give these suggestions of activities. So just to kind of pick out one, so a um, jigsaw activity, which people maybe have used before, the idea is that you take work, break it up into different pieces, and then you assign those pieces to different groups. Those groups you know, have read through, do an activity, have some discussion, and then they share back to the larger group. Um, obviously, in a Zoom setting, you could have those groups um, go into the breakout rooms. If you're not working, you know, not working with Zoom, or you have an expectation of needing to observe all of those groups, you just probably have to structure it a little bit differently. Maybe you're going to meet with groups at different times and then have a larger group meeting where people will share out. So it still is possible, um, even with some of those technical challenges. But I think that's kind of an example of something that would be very common to do in a traditional classroom that actually transfers really nicely into um, a virtual setting. There are certain things that 
do transfer nicely. So if you have some um, kind of classroom norms, especially based on this past year, I know that there are some things that you would have established in your regular classroom and it would just make sense to try to carry those over into a virtual setting. So if you did an informal check with kids showing hands or symbols or something that they held up, if you're able to kind of continue that in some way, then that would make sense and I would suggest that you continue to try to do that. For next year, you're just going to have to maybe um, be thoughtful whenever we find out what's going to happen for next year about putting some of those structures in place with the idea that of pivoting um, if any level of pivoting happens, you know, going back to school, coming out, or smaller groups, whatever the be. So maybe rethinking some of those things with the idea of what will work. Um, in terms of creating a classroom atmosphere, um, I think your class, your virtual classroom space, it does require some thought. I know sometimes we just think of like, oh, your Google Classroom, it's, you know, it's there and it is what it is but you really can create a kind of virtual classroom, a virtual scene around you. Um, for any of you that ha have children that watch YouTubers, it's so funny to see a YouTuber and their kind of space that they have around them that they do their recording in. It is really important and people make connections with those scenes. So I think to be thinking about that. I have seen some teachers be very thoughtful of, when they're recording themselves, video of themselves doing a lesson, the space that they're recording themselves in, and it, having very much a classroom feel, whether it's maybe the same chair that they were using when they did read alouds at school or something like that. So I think all of those little considerations are worth making. Um, Emma, did you want to chime in about Bitmojis and Bitmoji classrooms? Sure. So, <laughs> I know it's some of your passions. Yes, well, because I've seen some of the really amazing stuff that teachers are doing with it. And having been an online student for many years myself, I can really identify with that need for engagement. So um, Bitmoji has really transformed some ways that educators are leveraging um, technology. And some of those are, you know, making a Bitmoji classroom where they have their Bitmoji and then they have built this like virtual classroom scene. Sometimes they'll um, hyperlink images so that things are clickable so that when somebody um, clicks on the image, they could actually click through different things that are within the image. Um, and people are calling that kind of like their virtual Bitmoji classroom. Um, I have put a plug for this a few times, but um, if you haven't, got it in one of our previous sessions. If you're interested in learning about all things Bitmoji for education and you have um, Facebook, then check out the Bitmoji Craze for Educators group. It is a very, very cool group. There's all sorts of amazing things happening in there. Um, one of the things on this list is the idea of a flat teacher. And this is kind of that concept of printing out your Bitmoji or if you have a different avatar or, you know, you could even go old school and just use a photo of yourself that you print out in like a small size. And then um, these are getting mailed to students like in the in snail mail. <laughs> um, and then the students can kind of go on adventures with the teacher and, and have that experience of, you know, that it, some of the, po the posts and the pictures and stuff that I've seen of those kinds of strategies have just been phenomenal. It gets kids so excited. Um, and, and that is kind of based off, um, it is based off flat stand. I saw somebody mention that. So certainly that's something to be thinking about um, in the fall. I mean, thinking about those structures it might make sense to just plan like oh I'm, you know i'm going to do do this and if we go back in the fall then you'll have that kind of all set maybe the kids will just take the flat teacher home with them over the weekend and have some you know adventures or whatever the case may be so i think that's one of the ways that i know right now people are feeling really stressed out like how can we know even how to plan for anything and i think your best your best bet is to try to plan on those things that you can use for pivoting. So if we're in school, out of school, a lot of the things that we're showing you can be used, you know, regardless of our, you know, that, that context. Um, 
the backgrounds during meetings and recordings, I had kind of said like some teachers being really mindful about making a space around them that feels like a school. Um, if you're having a virtual meeting, I think the whole background, obviously I'm somebody like I'm, I'm in my basement. I brought my green screen down and tacked it up behind me. So my background is a little bit more interesting than my basement. Um, but you could really have fun with that. And I think that's one of the things to keep in mind that there are kind of some opportunities there that you might not really think of. So you could do, you know, some silly recordings and getting back to the sharing your personality and you know, building that humor to build relationships with students. Um, I think taking some time to be thoughtful about, you know, whether it's you're doing recordings or having those meeting times and just trying to, you know, have, have it be fun, have it be enjoyable so students really want to come there. And then if they're there and enjoying the space, they will be, you know, more ready to learn. That being said, um, a, lot of, a lot of screen time is definitely a challenge and just like a lot of seat time is a challenge. So I had a couple suggestions in here in terms of like brain breaks, movement breaks. If you obviously the younger you are, the shorter those attention spans are. So if I gave the example of Go Noodle because that's something I've seen used at a lot of schools. Um, you can just share your screen with them and say, you know, guys, we're gonna, you know, watch a Go Noodle video for just a couple minutes and I want you to get up and be moving around. That's certainly something that you can, you know, you can do and that's not fine. I mean, that's not, it's not a cop out to just kind of spend some time doing that. Um, I think music, if you, obviously, if you work with younger kids, I think having sing-alongs, I'd share Noodle Loaf in there is a fantastic podcast. So, I mean, you could share something like that if you're working asynchronously with students. You could share that and just say, you know, when you have some time, listen to this. Um, uh, if you follow me on Twitter, and I think we did have our handles in there earlier, I had shared a lot of different um, podcasts over the past couple months uh, that people might want to look at. So that's something to be considering if kids are kind of accessing content on their own time. And then Emma, did you want to share the background, the background music example? Because I think that's really hilarious. Yeah, sure. So that's something that I hadn't actually considered, except for some of you will probably know Jeopardy music always comes to my mind when we have the the, si the awkward silences on Zoom. But um, I helped to support a teacher at Actum and she thought to play a little bit of background music while she was having um, students work on their own. And I thought that that was a really great strategy, not only to just break up the monotony of the dead silence that you get in Zoom when everybody's muted or Google Meet, but also just that idea that um, the students had navigated away from the Zoom call to be working in a tool. And so when she stopped the music, it would kind of give them that indication to come back to um, the Zoom window. And so it was almost like that idea of musical chairs, you know, when the music stopped, they kind of knew they had to do something. So it was a cue. But it was also a really great way to break up, you know, kind of some of the boringness that can happen on those really quiet calls. So it was almost like a, a two tiered strategy. It was really fantastic. Um, yeah, and I think that's a good example. So those kinds of cues that a lot of people use in the, you know, use in a regular classroom, you can just use that over, over a Zoom call with kids. Um, that's definitely just something to be kind of thinking about that seems kind of small. And sometimes I think that's one of the things that's really important. There are lots of successes that I've heard from teachers, you know, big and small that I think want pe other people want to hear. Um, in terms of art, I know a lot of, a lot of people like Mo Willems, I know I watched some of his videos, um, different organizations have done some kind of art related projects, but I think you could do some directed drawings with students where you're kind of giving them instructions of what to go through and draw, and then kids at the end can share their drawings with their peers. Um, sketch notes is kind of an idea, and I to give the example of having kids access podcasts, if you have them listen to podcasts, sometimes doing some sketch noting while they're listening to that content can be 
helpful for them to kind of focus what it is that they're you know, taking in. And then kind of lastly, um, mindfulness and yoga. Um, if that's something that you're, you know, that you like to do yourself, a lot of people that are into, do that, into doing that and do that with their students, um, you can certainly do that over, you know, over a Zoom call or over a video conferencing. Um, I also shared out a piece out in Alway Island. You could just Google either of those. Those are some really nice podcasts for um, younger kids that get into mindfulness and kind of walk them through some different steps. So some considerations to be making there. Um, moving on to the next piece. I think one of the things to be thinking about as well, especially if you're getting kids on at the same time, is the potential for gamification as a way of engaging students. Um, I'm not going to go through every single one of these. I think probably there's potential to do, you know, lengthy sessions on a number of these. But like I said, the underlined ones in there are going to be linked when you get these, um, get this PowerPoint presentation. But something like Kahoot, if you're used to using your classroom, kids get how it works you can make that work in a virtual setting for different kids. Um, digital scavenger hunt, I just talked with a teacher the other day that had talked about doing some fun stuff with those. Um, I think there's a lot of potential there for engaging students with an activity that's, that's going on. Um, and then some of the other ones in there. Again, a big part of it is you can certainly tie it in with content and that's fantastic but if you're just looking to kind of build that engagement with students as well pull them into your session so you're making those connections and getting them getting them involved it is totally fine to do that as well so these tools can do either of those and then moving on to engagement tools so i think some of these are probably examples that a lot of us have seen before. Um, so choice boards, menus, I'm sure some of you had used those. I know they were pervasive at the elementary level that I saw a lot of different examples of choice boards and I'll share some in a little bit here. Um, the tic-tac-toe or think-tac-toe, so like a tic-tac-toe board where you've got a um, three by three, and the goal is to, you know, make a tic-tac-toe, you know, make a line. So that's a nice consideration. Challenge lists, I think just having like a list of activities and asking kids to like kind of go through and work through those. What I like about a lot of these is they focus so much on choice and letting kids do the different things that they, you know, might want to do. If you're concerned about you know, kids are always going to be doing the easiest ones and not really, you know, not doing the more challenging or heavy lifting ones. There are some models like the tiered activity plans or the themed menus. So the baseball one, I can kind of talk you through. So the idea of a baseball one is you would have different activities that count as a single, different that count as a double, different that count as a um, triple. The goal is they need to do X number of each to try to get up to a certain number. So that can be kind of one way of getting around that challenge of, oh, you know, the kids are gonna be doing, you know, all the easiest ones and kind of avoiding the more challenging ones. So there are some ways that you can design those um, to make sure that they are, you know, hitting those different levels of rigor and then also if you have kind of different content areas, that can be a challenge as well. That folk, kids would just focus on the ones that they, you know, the ones that they like or the ones they're interested in and not really stepping outside of their comfort zone. So you've kind of just have to design it with that in mind. Um, and like I said below, there are links to, there are some really great examples there and some the, the bottom one, the Shake Up Learning blog one, is really good in terms of if you're wanting to leverage a tool like Google to make your own and how can you make all of that happen. That kind of ties back into the second one from the bottom, HyperDocs. If you 
aren't familiar with hyperdocs, it's certainly something to be looking into um, at the, I think more at the secondary level in terms of a more engaged and involved project that could work in a remote learning setting. So I'm not gonna get too much into hyperdocs in the future, but that's definitely something you can look up and there are a lot of resources and examples that are out there. So what I do want is I want us to have some time to share. I'm sure going through this um, presentation so far, I know I haven't even really hopped on the chat at all to look at anything. I'm sure people are gonna have some suggestions of things that they have done, things that they have seen that have worked. I'm sure people are gonna have some challenges that they've had around engagement. And I think this is a good opportunity for any or all of that. So if you follow that QR code or follow that link, you can put that in the chat. Um, that'll take you to a Padlet and you from that can um, do both of those shares. Share what are, you know, what are the successes that you've seen, things that you're interested in, or what are challenges that you've had, because I'm sure people have had both successes and challenges. And I think one of the big, one of the big things right now is this is the opportunity looking back that we can really think reflectively about um, the very specific challenges, the very specific successes we had, and we can be sharing those with one another. Yep, so we'll get the we'll get the link in the chat in just a second here. <clears throat> I think M is ahead of me on getting the link in there. <laughs> we had a role. We had a role reversal. Usually, I'm the one that's pasting the links in the chat. Yep. <laughs> so that Padlet. Um, Again, once you have that, I mean, we've actually, it's funny, we had one the other day and a lot of people um, went back even after the session and were making some changes. So that was nice to see. One of the things that I've tried to really express to everyone that's been working with students working in schools during this time period is that there's so much, you know, there's so many learning opportunities that are happening and people are going through a lot of, obviously a lot of this has been very challenging and very exhausting. Um, but I think there are kind of little lessons that we can take from, um, from a lot of this and hopefully apply back to that we do in the future. So don't feel that anything that you share, even if it's like a small success, for me, this is where I've learned, I mean, this is where I've learned the most really from what's going on out in schools is from hearing teachers say just these little things. And even people that are kind of saying like, oh, you know, I don't feel like it's been very successful. Although this one time I did this and that seemed to work okay. And I think that's, this is really an example of something where we all can improve by working together and kind of sharing those examples as opposed to you know thinking that there's one silver bullet out there that's the thing that we need to find so much of what Emma and I are sharing in these remote learning sessions are you know are essentially collecting feedback from people hearing what's going on and then kind of putting it into a broader context. So I think that's just something to be mindful of. And that's why I like the idea of having a Padlet that we can just share 
and reference back to. And you can feel free, that Padlet will be active for a while, so that link will work. You can feel free to um, check back in and see what others contribute as we kind of go along as well. And it's also a good opportunity to do some modeling because Padlet's a fantastic opportunity or fantastic tool to use with remote learning. And um, I don't know if you noticed or didn't notice, but under each um, each entry on there, there's a little heart. And if you click on the heart, then it will like those different things. So it can be a nice way to flag flag stuff. And I like much like Instagram, you can only give positive feedback. So there's no no angry faces, no no crying faces, <laughs> just love. I can't get into it. I have no idea how to get into it. To get to the actual Padlet or to create a new post in it? To get to it. Did you try typing in this URL link into your web browser? No, I was going to try to copy and paste, but that didn't work either. <laughs> yeah, you might either have to just type it in or pull it from the chat and try to um, get an exact copy paste in there. Okay. All right, well, people are still working on that, but we wanna make sure we kinda of hit the last section of this and certainly get to the sharing how to do um, certification. Where are you? Where are you? There you are. So I have three examples of choice boards that I saw that teachers use that I really like some very specific parts of them. Um, again, if you have, you know, choice boards that you used or colleagues of your use that you want to share with me, I mean, again, the more the merry. Don't feel like anyone has, like, the perfect solution. I think it's a good learning opportunity. Um, but these one, this one here, what I really liked about this is, and this was, um, they leveraged Seesaw to share this out with students, but Working with elementary kids, there are a lot of visuals. There were links that took them out to different videos and stuff like that. So I think that's really helpful for especially younger age kids to have, you know, to have something that's just kind of visually appealing. And with Seesaw, they were able to do stuff like take pictures of, so like that lunch doodles that's on there. That took you out to Mo Willems' um, webinar. He was doing like a daily drawing activity so kids could actually do that activity watch this video do the drawing take a picture of it and then share it not only back with their teacher but also with their class so i think there's a lot of opportunities for something like that and that just seems like you know six boxes with some words and some links and images in there but really a powerful experience um this is one from bonnie eagle um their early elementary school so they had a social emotional learning menu that people could access and obviously there's a lot on here um, it is pretty text heavy but again not a not an ideal um, situation with remote learning as we're doing it right or we're doing it recently so that's kind of something to be thinking about as well and, but i like that it has the columns so you can see those horizontal columns, the nice categories that you can go through. Um, and the descriptions are very clear. I think a parent could look at that with a student, an elementary student, they could kind of get a sense of what are the different activities that they're being asked to do. So I think that's another nice example that I like. And then this last one is from uh, Waterville Junior High School. So I try to find something that's moving into secondary. Um, but this is kind of a menu of options. So you can see the focus of the week was simple machines. And then there were a variety of activities. This was used um, in conjunction with Google Classroom and Google Docs. So what was nice about this was that the teacher had shared a lot of those resources right on their Google Classroom. But then they had this kind of checklist separate that students could go through and actually make in the checks. And the one that I really liked was um, at the bottom, there was an other option for something so students could actually 
find, you know, find a YouTube video, find a podcast, an article, something like that, and share it back with the teacher. And they can actually kind of curate resources for the teacher. So I think that's one of the one of the things that's fantastic about this model is that you can get a nice back and forth going with students. Um, and it gives them a lot of variety of choices of things to do. So some students are going to learn best and process best from watching videos. Other students, they're going to want to prefer to read. Um, the video tutorial on there was actually the teacher doing kind of a, a mini lesson. Some, some students would really like that. So I think this one really speaks to the variety of options available. So those are kind of a quick list of or quick examples of three kind of choice boards out there. Um, as with every session, we've tried to put together a checklist of kind of some big considerations to be making. So just to go through these quickly, providing opportunities for individuals and group sharing, I think that's one of the things that's really important that students have those you know, different opportunities and that they're able to share and make connections with others bringing in your parents and families as much as possible um, is certainly key to success for a lot of students to kind of keep them on task and focused and let everybody know what's going on um, offering variety choice options i mean everybody has their learning preferences and if you're worried about people kind of leaning too heavily on you know their preferences or interests there are always kind of mechanisms that you can put in place. So students feel like they still have some choice, but they're being kind of, you know, kept, kept expand, you know, expanding and trying things that are maybe outside of their usual comfort zone. Um, this is a big one. No one, sits, one size fits all. I think having, a, again, having a variety is fantastic, but also on the teacher end to be kind of mixing up the way that you're doing things and try to, best figure out what, you know, what's working and realize that, you know, what works with one student isn't going to necessarily work with an, another student or another class. And that can change from, you know, year to year, class to class. And as much as possible, try to keep things fun, gamify things. That is essential to engagement. So much of engagement is getting students to come back and finding those little hooks to get them to want to come back. So they're hungry to come back and do more learning. So that's kind of ending our checklist. We've got just about a minute or two with questions. So I don't know if anybody has kind of a, a burning question, but maybe to add that into the chat. And if we don't get to it right now, we certainly can send a message along. And you also could add it into the Padlet as well. That might be helpful. Um, this is the link and a QR code for the certificate that you'll get for this professional development. So make sure I think we'll probably make sure to drop that into the chat. But it's right down there on the bottom of the screen. Yeah, John, if you want to drop it into the chat, I don't want to stop sharing my screen while people oh. are still writing it down. Yes, that's right. I can do that. <laughs> Just in case you haven't um, used this system before, or also in case you might have noticed that the system has changed potentially even several times since you started this series for the certificates. Um, don't be alarmed The we've switched to a um, DOE website hosted certificate system. So once you hit submit on your form, you'll get prompted with a link to follow and then you'll type your name into a little box that pops up and you can save or print your certificate from there. We've had a few questions um, via email. I haven't had a chance to respond to people yet, but we have had a few questions wondering like, am I in the right place? Because it looks totally different. And so yeah. I just figured I'd mention that. So the link is in the chat. Um, for those of you who don't have the chat, um, I should say that those are ones, not L's. So if you're looking at the at the link there. And Emma, do we have time to do a poll for those yeah, who can sure stick can. around? So I'd love to, we put together a poll question. So I feel like we 
had a ton of stuff that we were trying to cover here. So I'm just curious if we were to delve into any of these pieces a little bit more deeply, where do people's interests lie? Um, I think there's definitely an opportunity to do much, much more. And we just want to try to be responsive to what people genuinely want. Yep, if we're going to dig deeper, we'd like to <laughs> dig deeper into something you actually want to dig deeper into. So, and de Or definitely make sure that the thing that people are most interested in that we definitely, definitely yes, tackle. Yes, of course. So just in case anyone is not familiar yet, next week we will be finishing up module two. It'll be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at 11. And then module three will be the following week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at 11. Uh, actually, Tuesday will be at 1 p.m., the 23rd. That is the only one that will not be at 11. Um, yes. But that's in the, it's in the description that you'll get via email. Um, and we're also doing help sessions Tuesdays and Thursdays at 3 p.m. on specific tools. Today is, we'll be talking about presentation tools. Um, so feel free to join us for that. And it looks like we've got 111 people of 167 who've responded. I'm just gonna leave this open for another minute. Um, if you have to hop off and go to another call, don't worry about sticking around. But thank you all for joining us. It's been great. And we'll see you next week, hopefully. Yes, definitely. Bye, everybody.